Welcome to the National Constitution Center. We're here to talk about the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. It's one of the crown jewels of our constitutional history. And if Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence promised that all men are created equal, it took the 14th Amendment after the bloodiest war in American history to make that promise a reality. So what does the 14th Amendment say? Well, the best place to read it is on the Interactive Constitution, which you can find in the App Store and also at constitutioncenter.org. And I've got mine here, and I'm gonna to read to you the first part of the 14th Amendment. There are basically three big clauses we're gonna talk about, and the first one is called the Privileges or Immunities Clause. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Well, what does that mean? The Privileges or Immunities Clause, like the rest of the 14th Amendment, was drafted by someone called John Bingham. He was an Ohio congressman, and for him the Privileges or Immunities Clause was one of the most important parts because it ensured that no state could abridge the fundamental rights of American citizenship. The original Bill of Rights applies only to Congress. It says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. What are the privileges or immunities of citizenship that states can't abridge? Well, they include most of the rights in the original Bill of Rights, like the rights of free speech, the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. They also include rights to make contract and to sue and be sued, the basic civil rights that had been denied by Southern states after the Civil War to African-American citizens. And the clause guarantees that all citizens, African-American, white, anyone at all, is entitled to these basic privileges or immunities, and it was an incredibly important guarantee. Unfortunately, the Privileges or Immunities Clause was basically read out of the Bill of Rights by the Supreme Court in a case called the Slaughterhouse Cases that came down soon after the 14th Amendment was passed. Because of that, it took another clause of the 14th Amendment, known as the Due Process Clause, to incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states, a process that took almost 100 years. So let's talk next about the Due Process Clause. What does that say? Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Well, that's hugely important and interesting in a bunch of ways. First of all, it applies to all persons, not just citizens. Persons include citizens and aliens alike. So these are basic rights that have to go to all people, whether or not they're citizens of the United States. The Supreme Court has interpreted that clause to mean that there are certain rights or liberties that are so fundamental that they can't be deprived of any person without extremely good reasons, even with a trial or with due process. What are these rights and liberties? Well, they include some of those rights in the original Bill of Rights that John Bingham had wanted to bind the states through the Privileges and Immunities Clause. But they also include some rights that actually aren't written down in the original Constitution. The Supreme Court has recognized that some of those rights include basic rights of contract, during the Progressive Era, in a case called the Lochner case, the court said that the rights of contract are so fundamental that they can't be deprived under the Due Process Clause. And they also include rights of reproductive autonomy. The famous case Roe v. Wade in 1973 said that the rights of reproductive choice are so fundamental that they can't be deprived under the Due Process Clause. Now, this idea that there are certain rights that aren't written down in the Constitution but are nevertheless protected by the Due Process Clause is known as substantive due process. It's a funny technical term, but it basically means these substantive liberties are so important that they can't be deprived except with very good reasons. This doctrine of substantive due process is controversial. Some people say judges should only enforce rights that are actually written down in the original Constitution. Others disagree. And I want you to learn about this debate by reading these cases, like the Lochner case and Roe v. Wade. Read the majority opinions, read the dissents, and make up your own mind. There's a final clause of the 14th Amendment known as the Equal Protection Clause, so let's read that one. It says, no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. At the time after the Civil War, it meant that there are certain basic civil rights that had to be extended to all persons, white and black, citizens and aliens alike. And yet, right after the 14th Amendment was passed, the Supreme Court held that it was okay for the states to enforce separate but equal railway cars and to force African-American people to ride separately from white people when they took the train. It took decades for the Supreme Court to overturn that case, and in 1954, in the famous Brown versus Board of Education decision, the Supreme Court said that separate but equal public facilities are inherently unequal 
and that states could not force African-American citizens to go to separate public schools from white people. Separating people on the basis of race, the court recognized, can create feelings of inferiority and can stigmatize and degrade African-Americans in ways that are inconsistent with the promise of the 14th Amendment that any legislation that signaled that one group was inferior to another was inherently unequal. It finally made real the promise of Jefferson, of Lincoln at Gettysburg, and of the 14th Amendment itself by insisting that the 14th Amendment neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The Brown case ensured that the promise of the 14th Amendment became constitutional reality.